welcome to visitors to our worship service this evening. May you experience God's grace as we exalt his holy name. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Let's prepare our hearts to worship God with a moment of silent prayer. congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah, who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from, our, from God our Father, and from Jesus Christ our Lord, and through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing Psalter number 79. Number 79, Thoughts on God's Loving Kindness. Psalm 30 gives us the words. Let's sing the three stanzas of 79. time we give confession of our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's open our Psalters again, and this time sing 179. One hundred seventy nine invocation and praise. Let God arise, and by his might let all his foes be put to flight. But all ye righteous gladly sing, exalt before your God and King. Let's sing the four stanzas of one hundred seventy nine. come before our God in prayer. Lord God in heaven, we know that faith is a gift. Wilt thou grant it to us? Faith sees things that are unseen by the natural eye gives us a spiritual sight. And we need that, Lord. We are by nature very earthly minded and we are by nature very self-centered. The things that we see with our natural eye affect us, O oh Lord. We're tempted by the evil one, we confess. We're tempted by him, especially through our eyes. We know that he is no fool. He knows how to get to us. As he placed before the Lord Jesus Christ's eyes, the shimmering glory of the kingdoms of this world, he places before our eyes the shimmering glory of sin. Its empty pleasures can look so wonderful to all of us, especially the young people and young adults of the congregation. Its empty glory captures the unguarded soul Lord God, how can we resist him? And how can our youth resist him? 
as individuals and together as a congregation. Accept thy spirit, work in us through thy word. Take that word, Holy Spirit, bind it to us so that the will of our Father becomes central in our mind and our will submitted to His. Accept that word. Expose the emptiness of the devil's offers. We are undone. It shows us the glory, the pleasure of what it would be to disobey God's law, to go against His way, to walk with someone as young people with whom we are not agreed, to live for the pleasures of this earth and the fulfillment of the lusts of the flesh. He offers it, and He dresses it so nicely. The temptation is so strong. Heavenly Father, help us by spirit and word. Fill our minds and our souls with the glory of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, so that all else is dim. Warn us of the devil's tactics, tactics and of his motives. There is a temptation too, Heavenly Father, we know to think because of the devil's temptation that the kingdom comes by observation. That if there are great buildings of brick and stone and that if there are big letters behind people's names that the kingdom must be found there. That where earthly glory is there things are really happening. The temptation is to think very little of the simple means of grace, of regular biblical worship, of office bearers who faithfully carry out their calling, ruling over the souls of the congregation and supplying the mercies of Christ, O oh Lord, do not let us be fooled by the devil's third temptation that we observe this evening. Don't allow our young people and young adults to be fooled. And we follow our Lord Jesus Christ who resisted earthly glory for a kingdom that would exist among the kingdoms of men without fanfare and without observation, but that would one day rule over the new heavens and new earth in full glory and full splendor that has never been known. And honor thy Son, Lord God. He has gone the way of rejection, suffering, and the cross in order to establish the kingdom that thou hast ordained for him from before the foundations of the earth. He has submitted his will perfectly unto thine. We observe in the written record of his life his suffering man of sorrows, he certainly was, and acquainted with grief. The cross he bore, as we will observe this Friday evening, the cross of utter rejection for our sins. As thou hast promised him, give him to see his seed. Give him to see his seed here, Father, we pray, if it is thy will. Be pleased, Lord Jesus Christ, to observe souls who by faith see what cannot be seen with the natural eye. Live for the heavenly kingdom here. Take delight in the fruit of thy work as thou dost observe us in our children. Seeking the spiritual kingdom of God, this is only by grace, Father. And only by the Spirit. Therefore, Lord Jesus, take delight in thy work. And come back, King of Kings. So that what is now faith on our part may one day be sight. Roll back the clouds like a scroll. Sound the trumpet and descend, Lord Jesus. Bring in thy full glory and power so that all may see that thy refusal of Satan's third temptation brought about the kingdom 
of Jesus Christ, the heavenly kingdom of God, and all of its glory, power, and wisdom, and might. We're not comfortable here, O Lord. We are pilgrims and strangers. But on that day, when all sin will be removed, and those who have had hard hearts before Thee, and the earth will be made new, we will be home. Take us there with all Thy saints, we pray. We ask that Thou wilt bless those who labor under Thy sovereign hand in word and in doctrine for that glorious kingdom. We thank tonight of Reverend Stewart in Northern Ireland and Reverend McGowan, our sister church mission in Northern Ireland, and the witness that goes forth through those men to all of Europe and all over the world. We ask Thy blessing upon that congregation and all the various groups that they have contact with and the glories of the Reformed faith that go out from that light in that place. O oh Lord, use Thy Word powerfully and mighty, mightily for the salvation of Thy own. We ask Thy blessing to be upon Reverend Andy Landing and the saints in Singapore of our sister church there. The going forth of Thy Word in that place Pray that Thou wilt comfort the hearts of that congregation as they face the loss there of their first pastor, Pastor Lau. Thankful, nonetheless, that after much suffering for him, he may receive the eternal reward of the saints. And every tear might be wiped away from his eyes. Wholeness and sinless perfection with Jesus might be his. We ask Thy blessing upon the vacant congregations of our denomination our sister church here in Dune, we ask, Father, that Thou will care for them. And as they say their farewell to their minister this evening, bless them with the comfort of Thy nearness and Thy love. We pray for Reverend Overway and his family as they leave tomorrow, head off to a new labor. Care for them, strengthen them. Bless the young people and young adults who meet this evening after the service. Bind them to the church and to the truth of thy word. And they see the importance of right knowledge. Do not withhold from our generations, Lord, the love of the truth, we pray. Forgive our sins and open thou our eyes. For Jesus' sake do we pray. Amen. This time we give our offering. The offering this evening is for the whole Protestant Reformed Christian school.
They'll sing 255. <clears throat> 255. Let's sing the first three stanzas. 255. text for the sermon this evening is from Matthew 4, verses 8 through 11. As background to that passage, which is the third temptation of Christ, let's turn first to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 15. Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 15. This is Moses speaking to the Israelites, warning them of a temptation that will come upon them when they enter into the land of Canaan. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name, Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, we'll begin reading at verse 8. We carry on this evening with our Lenten series. 
now with the third and final temptation of Jesus Christ. Matthew 4, verse 8. But we'll read Matthew 4, verses 8 through 17. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The text this evening is verses 8 through 11 of Matthew 4. Let's read that again. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Beloved of God, if you recall, we have said that each of the three temptations the devil gives to Jesus contains a two pronged attack on our salvation. A two-pronged attack because Jesus committed himself to a two-pronged work on behalf of our salvation. The Lord Jesus, we saw at his baptism, committed himself to the task that the triune God had decreed for him from all eternity, namely the task of fulfilling all righteousness. In order to fulfill all righteousness for us, he had to do two things. He had to himself be perfectly righteous every second of his life so that he might impute his perfect righteousness to you and me who are unrighteous that we might have the right to be sons and daughters of God in him. Secondly, in order to fulfill all righteousness, he must take away our unrighteousness so that we might have the right to be sons and daughters of God in him. And this he would do, of course, by going the way of his cross. The devil's desire, therefore, we saw, in these temptations, is to stop Jesus from doing both of those two things. So in the temptations, we saw that two-pronged attack. The devil tempts Jesus to be personally unrighteous, to be a faithless son to his father, so that there is no righteousness to impute to you and to me. And he tempts Jesus to bypass the way of the cross and to build a kingdom some other way, so that we might remain unrighteous for all eternity. In the first two temptations, that personal attack on Jesus' personal righteousness was on the foreground, and that was the first point of both of those sermons. And the attempt to drive Christ off of the way of the cross was in the background of those first two temptations and was the second point of both of those sermons. Now, in the third temptation, the temptation to go another way than the way of the cross, 
is on the foreground. And the personal attack on Jesus' personal righteousness is now wrapped up in that temptation to forsake the way of the cross. The two are weaved together in the third temptation. And that is how I will preach it this evening. The devil has his last throw of the dice in our text tonight. He's all in. He lays everything out before Jesus in one grand final temptation. As he calls the beloved Son of God to bow down to him instead of his Father. To receive from him a kingdom instead of from his Father. The beloved Son tempted by a kingdom. Let's notice first the temptation. Second, the appeal of this temptation. And third, the resistance. The beloved son, tempted by a kingdom. The temptation, the appeal, and the resistance. The devil here, by a supernatural power that God has allowed him, takes Jesus to the top of an exceeding high mountain. We don't know which mountain that was. The scriptures give us no indication at all. All we know is that it is an exceeding high mountain. From the top of this mountain, the text says, the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. The parallel account in Luke 4 verse 5 says that he showed him all of those kingdoms in a moment of time. That doesn't mean that the sight only lasted one second and then it was gone. It simply means that Jesus did not travel to all of the kingdoms of the world in order to see them, but the vision of all of the kingdoms of the world was before him at the same moment. Apparently, therefore, the devil gave Jesus some sort of supernatural vision of all the kingdoms of the world. But he did not show Jesus everything about the kingdoms of the world. It's important to note that in Matthew 4, verse 8, it says the devil showed Jesus specifically the glory of those kingdoms. The glory. Glory means the greatness, the splendor, the earthly majesty of those kingdoms. He showed Jesus the palaces of the kings that lived in these kingdoms. He showed them, he showed Jesus their great works. He showed him their great buildings and great cities. He revealed to Jesus the glories of the Roman Empire, the seed of human civilization and earthly power and bureaucracy. He showed Jesus the glory of ancient Greece, the birthplace of human philosophy and culture. He showed Jesus the great civilizations in the Indus Valley and in the Far East with their advanced organization and discipline. He showed Him the great kingdom of Egypt, with its advanced architecture and engineering and its pyramids reaching up to the sky. And the devil told Jesus that all of this, all of it, and all of the people in it can be yours. I will give it to you, Jesus, right here, right now. Luke's account records it this way. Luke 4, verse 6. All this power I will give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. I own all of these kingdoms of the earth, Jesus. And I own all of the people in them. And I will hand all of them over to you right now. I will make you king. I will make you ruler, emperor. Not over just one of those kingdoms, and not over just the best one, but over the entire earth. I will make you sole ruler of all the world. Of course, though the devil does not say it, Jesus would rule over all that world under the devil. Jesus knows this, and that is why when he refuses the offer, he says, not only must I worship God alone, Satan, but I must serve God alone. Jesus knows that if he took this offer, he would be serving Satan. He would be a vassal, really under Satan and ultimately working, serving Satan's own ends. That's evident too 
from the condition that the devil attaches to the offer. All you have to do, Jesus, to get this is bow down to me and worship. Pledge your allegiance to me, Jesus. Give me your heart. Give me your devotion. Place yourself under me. Serve me. And I will give you all power over all the earth at my right hand. And together, you and me, me ultimate ruler, you under me, we will rule the whole world for our own glory, Jesus. That's the offer here. The ob obvious question, first of all, then, is did the devil have the right to make this offer to Jesus? And from one very important perspective, the answer to that question, beloved, is an emphatic yes. Yes. From the ultimate perspective, of course, the devil has no absolute power at all. The devil ultimately has no sovereignty over anything. The earth is the Lord's, as the scriptures say, and the fullness thereof. As Luther was fond of saying, the devil himself is God's devil, and God has sovereign power over him too. But from the point of view of rights, right to rule, the devil had rightful kingship over the kingdoms of this earth under the sovereignty of God. The devil has a kingdom, and it includes all the kingdoms of the world. The devil has the legal right to rule in that kingdom. Adam handed him that right. In the fall of man into sin, Adam handed the legal right to all men's souls over to the devil. Remember that Adam was created the king of the earth. He was called to rule over this earth on behalf of God. But when Adam fell to sin, he bowed down to Satan. He served him. He gave his allegiance to him, placed himself under Satan's rule. Adam thought that it was going to be a step up to do so, that it would mean power for him. He could be like God. But instead, he became a slave of Satan and was doomed to consciously serve him in sin, accept God's grace, reclaim him once again. But when Adam did that, it affected more than just Adam. For Adam was no ordinary man. Adam was set up as the head of the entire human race. He was created to be the legal and organic head of all men. Therefore, when Adam bowed down to Satan, what he did was he offered all of us in this world, in the whole human race, to be citizens of Satan's kingdom and under Satan's rule. So that unless God himself comes to intervene and to gain the legal right to rule over his people once again, the devil has the legal title to all the souls of the kingdoms of men. This is why Jesus later calls the devil the prince of this world. That's why the Apostle Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that now works in every single one of the children of disobedience. Rule over a kingdom is not only due to might, but it's due to right. And though Satan does not have all power over heaven and earth, God does, Satan does have the legal right under God to all men by nature. And if Jesus would now bow down to the devil, the devil could make Jesus ruler over all men under himself. Of course, there are lies and there are manipulations in the offer the devil makes too. This is the devil, after all. The manipulator, the twister. In unveiling before Jesus' eyes all the glories of the world's kingdom, the devil holds back the sin and the consequences of sin that's found in the kingdoms of the world. He shows Jesus only the glory of them. He withholds the cesspools of immorality and decay and disease and strife and murder and chaos. He hides all this from Jesus and only shows him the gilded edge. Besides, he does not spell out to Jesus the consequences of bowing down to himself. Just like in the Garden of Eden, the 
devil hid from Adam the consequences of bowing down to him. There's manipulation. There's lie. But in the end, he does have the legal right to offer the souls of the world to Jesus Christ. Be that as it may, what is the devil's angle here? What is really driving him in offering this to our Lord Jesus? In the first two temptations, you will remember that the clue to the essence of the devil's motive was found in that phrase he kept using at the beginning. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, turn the stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, jump off of the pinnacle of the temple. Both times he had done that, and that was the clue for us to what he was getting at. And now, in the third temptation, the clue to the essence of the devil's motive here is found in that he doesn't say that this time. The first two temptations were a negative attack upon that declaration the Father had made over His Son in His baptism. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The devil had tried in the first two temptations to put a wedge between that relationship by attempting to get Jesus to distrust His Father's provision and to distrust His Father's protection. But all of that in the devil's mind was a setup for this third and final temptation where now the devil is not trying to attack that relationship anymore. He's trying instead to replace it. The point now is not to try to get Jesus to question his father or to make his father prove something to him audaciously. The point now is to try to step in and to say to Jesus, I will be your father, and I want you to be my son. The devil does not want to bring up that declaration of God now. He leaves it off because his goal is to replace that declaration with one of his own. He wants to be able to say himself over Jesus, you're my beloved son, Jesus, and I, I am well pleased in you. Bow down to me. Make me your father now. Become my son. Conform your will to mine, not to his. Worship me. Bow to me. And together we will rule the world. The devil is laying down his cards. He's revealing his hand here. This is what he's been after all along. This is his, this is his final attempt. It's all or nothing. And like, like a petty high school girl, first attacks the character of the girlfriend of the boy that she likes, and then at the opportune moment tries to slip herself in as the alternative the devil has attacked the fatherhood of Jehovah God and now thinks that he can slip himself in and become Jesus' father himself. The devil's goal is always to supplant God, to overthrow God, and to become God himself. That was his goal at the very beginning when he was thrown down from heaven in the first place. He revolted in heaven. That's how he became the devil. He started out as an angel of God, but he attempted to revolt and to overthrow God's place and to become God himself. And for this, he was cast down to hell. And always after that, this is his ultimate goal. I will be God and not him. In tempting Adam in the garden, that was his goal. He wanted to supplant God and to become God himself. And his temptation to Adam there was the same as it is to Jesus here. Adam, son of God, become Adam, son of the devil. With Israel, that was his goal. Israel, bow down to me. 
serve me, make me your God and your Father, and not him. Always, he is seeking to carry out his original mission, to overthrow God and to become God himself. And this is his ultimate attempt. As he tempts the Lord Jesus Christ to bow down to him. I ask you, therefore, is it more than coincidence that here the devil takes Jesus up to a mountain and gives Jesus the commandment to worship him? Did not God call Moses up to Mount Sinai and give him commandments, the chief of which was to worship me as God and his Father alone? The devil is now seeking to supplant God by taking Jesus up to the mountain and giving him the anti-law. Don't worship God. Don't worship your father. Worship me and worship me alone. Has your father promised Jesus to give you an inheritance? Has he promised as your father to give you a universal kingdom from every nation, tribe, and tongue? Has he said to you, Jesus, in Psalm 2 verse 8, I shall give you the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Well, I will do that too. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, all the nations and all the people for your inheritance. But I will be a better father to you than he will. For I'll give you the same inheritance. but I won't make you suffer in order to get it. No work, no suffering, no way of rejection, and no cross. Give me your allegiance. Come to me. Make me your father. Bow down, and instantly, all of it will be yours. What Satan is offering is that Christ foundation of the kingdom and the king of the kingdom of God become instead the antichrist foundation and king of the kingdom of Satan and beloved of God the great appeal of this offer is just what we said that Jesus could have a kingdom and he could have great glory earthly glory in that kingdom without the way of suffering and rejection and the cross. There was no desire in Jesus Christ, of course, to go against the will of His Father. But there was a holy desire in Him not to face the eternal wrath of His Father. And Satan is offering Jesus a shortcut. You don't have to go the way of the cross. Bypass the rejection, the unbelievably difficult suffering. You really want to be what the prophet said you would be? Man of sorrows, acquainted with grief all your life long? You want to build a kingdom by experiencing the eternal, unending wrath of God for a certain number of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue? I'll give you every nation, tribe, and tongue without any suffering at all. And in fact, Jesus... My kingdom will be better anyway. I'll give you not just some elect number in that kingdom, but I'll give you every single person that has ever lived. Instead of you saying in John chapter 6, All that the Father hath given me shall come to me. I can offer you a kingdom where everybody comes to you. Every single person. No one would be outside this kingdom it would be all inclusive. In addition, you won't have to wait very long for this kingdom to be built. It's not going to take thousands of years to gather your elect for you to have your kingdom. I'll give it to you all right now in a moment. Just bow the knee. Not only that, Jesus. Think about it. It would be glorious. can sit on the throne over all the kingdoms of men and unite 
every single man to yourself under your own rule. Don't you see it, Jesus? All the glory of that earth that I showed you could be yours. Real, earthly glory. Everyone will look to you. Everyone. The glory that was Rome, that was Greece, that is Egypt, and all the future glory that the world has to offer can come together under you, Jesus. You, the glory and power of the United States of America that is to come. All of it, everything would be yours. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Jesus would have taken the offer. He would be ruling over this country right now. Not only this country, but over the entire earth. He'd be sole ruler, emperor, king over all the world if he had accepted. What a wonderful existence that would be. No worries about what laws the leader would pass. He could provide for everyone. No more hunger anymore on the face of the earth. He could rule in perfection. The whole world would be unified under his rule. Finally, man would achieve what he's always desired, a unified kingdom on this earth. He could make the laws that he wanted. Maybe even abortion could be outlawed. Maybe he could even get all businesses closed on Sunday. It would be a mighty kingdom unified under his scepter. Humanity would progress like it never had before. You couldn't even imagine. We would achieve things that we never could possibly achieve can you imagine what it would be like? And all without the way of rejection and suffering of the cross. Earthly glory. The climax of human potential in this life. If only he bows down. In essence, this exact same temptation was given to Israel of old. Earthly glory in exchange for bowing down to Satan and his idols. And the appeal of that temptation to the Israelites in the Old Testament was the exact same appeal for Jesus here. Earthly glory without the way of suffering and the rejection of the world. Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing that he is the new and true Israel of God, once again points that out to us by his choice of Old Testament text to refute Satan here. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. In the context of that passage, as we read this evening, God is warning Israel of the Old Testament not to fall, to the exact same temptation that the devil brings to Jesus right here. In the context of Deuteronomy 6, verse 13, God is warning Israel not to forsake him for the earthly glory of this world. And though that warning comes to the Israelites while they are in the wilderness on the Exodus, God is warning them about a temptation that's going to come to them at the end of the exodus after they're out of the wilderness and are settled into the land of Canaan. God tells them, once I bring you into the land of Canaan and you're settled there and you have, quote, great and splendid cities and, quote, houses full of good things, beware lest you forget the Lord and begin to worship idols. Why would they forget the Lord and begin to worship idols? Because having a taste of earthly things and earthly success and earthly glory and earthly power, they will be tempted to think that that is what matters in this world and they will be tempted to pursue that earthly glory. And in order to sustain that earthly glory and to gain more of that earthly glory, they will realize that they need to fit in with the nations of the world, that they have to worship the gods that the nations worship and do what the nations do and seek what the nations seek. And beware, lest the lust for earthly glory, earthly acceptance, earthly power lead you to forget who you really are, the Son of Jehovah God. Be warned, Israel, says God. I am your Father, not the idols. 
and I will give you an inheritance that is greater than all the kingdoms of this world. An inheritance that is ultimately a city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. It's not earthly glory ultimately, it's heavenly glory that is your inheritance. That's your kingdom that I give as your father. Don't throw it all away for earthly glory by bowing down to the idols of the world, by bowing down to Satan himself who is behind those idols. And of course, that's exactly what the Israelites did. God led them into the promised land, and as soon as Joshua died, they sought the gods and the glory of the nations around her. She forsook God, became son of the devil himself, bowed down to the evil one. And now the devil comes to Jesus and says to him, Adam did it. Israel did it. Now you do it. Come, be my son. All the glory of the world awaits. The devil tempts the church with this offer too, doesn't he? Come have earthly glory. This will be your inheritance. Beloved of God, if you think that the transformationalist worldview that is taught in many Christian colleges, including the local one, is not a very big deal, then you are mistaken. In principle, in principle, it is the devil's third temptation applied to the church. I know not everyone takes it to its ultimate logical conclusion, but no matter how far it is taken or not taken, the point is that the principle is the devil's principle right here. Earthly glory for the church. And the appeal is the same appeal. Earthly glory without the way of rejection and suffering, without the way of bearing the cross. Does it not strike you that the church is currently facing the same temptation that the devil gave Jesus, and that parts of the church are falling to it? The church's goal must be this life-centered, this world-centered, the church's focus must be to transform the culture of this world. The glory of the church and the kingdom of God will be attained if we get enough people in the music and arts and film industries, if we infiltrate the power structures of this world, the businesses, the banks, the politics, the economies. We can make real great progress then. All the world could maybe even be united under the Christians as their head. We can outlaw abortion then finally. We can even perhaps make a law that things be closed on Sunday if we want. It will be glorious. We'll be able to develop human potential to its fullest. This earth will contain human flourishing like has never been seen. Now certainly, if you have the gifts for art, for business, use them. Certainly, if you can be a politician to the glory of God without compromising His Word, do it. Certainly, if you can make progress in helping to outlaw abortion, by all means do so. But understand that doing this does not establish the kingdom of our God. It is not the church's goal, and it is not the church's task, for it is not the kingdom of Christ. Don't you see what is happening in this third temptation? Satan is willing to give up the culture. He's willing to give up the businesses. He's willing to give up the art. He's willing to give up the finance. You may have it, but 
you will always place this condition. You must first bow to me. You must first give up the cross in order to get it. Just as long as you stop preaching the offense of the cross as the central focus of the life of the church, just so long as you water doctrine down so that the scandal of the Christian gospel is rarely if ever heard, just so long as you give up biblical truth, give up biblical church discipline, sell out the glory of God and doctrine and life and worship for the glory of man instead, forsake the way of suffering and rejection and reproach for Christ in this world and pursue the world in its glory, then I will give you all the culture that you want. Bow down to me, and you may have it. And don't you see, beloved? He'll give it. He'll give it. But he will never give it unless the church first bows down. Satan was willing to hand it all over to Jesus. Because he doesn't care so much if abortion gets outlawed. That's a problem for him, but it's not his main problem. He doesn't care so much if Jesus wants to make a law that says no businesses can be opened on Sunday. That would bother him, but it's not the greatest thing that would bother him. He doesn't care so much if people all across the earth become wealthy and hunger ceases. Just so long, just so long, as there is no cross. For the devil knows that God's kingdom is built upon the offense of the cross. And he knows that it's not those things that are going to undo him. It is the cross and the word of God that will undo him. The devil knows that his own kingdom is ultimately a spiritual kingdom too. And that it's going to be the cross that will destroy his kingdom and banish him and it into the lake of fire one day. Jesus or the church can have all the earthly power that they want just so long as there is no atonement to appeal to before the judgment seat of God. Have the earth, give up the cross. Beloved, the church is falling to this temptation. Not everyone, not everyone to the same degree. But when the church world makes the error of thinking the kingdom is established in earthly progress and earthly glory, and preaches transformation, social gospel at its worst, earthly power, what so often inevitably gets pushed aside God's word and all of its truth and all of its beauty and the offense of the cross and the whole counsel of God that is centered upon that cross and glorifies that cross for the church starts to realize that she can't have glory in this world without giving up that offense and slowly but surely she apostatizes just like Israel when she entered Canaan as she pursues the glory of the world, all in the name of God, but forgets God in spirit and in truth. But this temptation comes to the child of God as an individual as well. The devil sets before each one of us the world in all of its glory, he sets before us, especially the young people and young adults of the church, its gilded edges, its attraction, its pleasures, its niceties. And he tells us, he'll give it to us. He'll give it all to us. And all we have to do is put the cross of Jesus Christ away. You can go back to it later if you want. That's fine. You can come back to Jesus later in your life. Just put him on the shelf for now and come bend the knee. Your Father promises you a kingdom of heaven. You know it's going to come in the way of rejection, in the way of being different from everybody else, even some people who take the name of Christ. Let me be your Father. I'll give you a kingdom. 
And I don't require the way of rejection and suffering. You can have all that your heart desires. Just come and bow to me. Give me your worship. Give me your service. Love what I love. You can keep going to church if you want. That's fine. Love what I love. I'll give you all that this world has to offer. Beloved of God, Jesus resisted this temptation of the devil. His heart, and his service, his life, and his worship was for his Father, and his Father alone. He takes God's command to Israel in Deuteronomy 6, verse 13, as the command to himself as the new Israel of God. And where Israel of old fails, he does not fail. Matthew 4, verse 10, he looks the devil in the eye and says, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus has come to bow to the will of his Father, and whereas Adam and Israel were deceived to defect to the other side, the beloved Son would not be deceived. He knew that the devil's offer was ultimately a sham anyway. He saw that the glory of the devil's kingdom is an illusion, that it has no ultimate significance, that for all of its gilded edge, it's full of sin and rebellion and the consequences of sin. It is the depraved glory of man and will develop one day into the anti-Christian kingdom and will be destroyed first by the sin that is within its own walls, and then by God Himself. Jesus knew that all true glory is God's glory, and that He would build a kingdom with God's glory at his, as its central focus and aim. That it would be a kingdom that would last forever, whose glory would not be diminished. A kingdom that one day would be free of all sin and the consequences of sin. A kingdom where the members, the citizens, are taken up into the very covenant life of Jehovah God Himself from everlasting to everlasting, where God and His people are together forever as husband and bride. And though it would take a few thousand years or more to build, it would be a kingdom that was truly, truly glorious. Jesus knew that this kingdom though it would not include every single man. It would include all that the Father had chosen from all eternity. He knew that the reprobate who are removed work for Father's glory too. He knew that those chosen to be in it are from every single nation, tribe, and tongue and constitute the new human race. And Jesus knew too that though Satan had offered him every single human being, that Satan's offer ultimately included not even one human being. On earth, for a temporary moment, it would include every single human being. But then when every man dies, they would end up in their destruction in hell. The devil's kingdom is a kingdom in the end that helps no one at all, but leaves all in Satan's hellish grasp. God's kingdom is the only true kingdom, and it will destroy Satan and his self-seeking enterprise once and for all. And praise be to God. This perfect son was willing to be the perfect sacrifice and go the way of suffering and reproach and rejection and cross to build this glorious kingdom of God. If you ask yourself the question, did the devil really think, did he really deep down think that he was going to get Jesus to fall to this? The answer to that, beloved, is yes, he did. Because the devil 
looked at Jesus through his own self-seeking and devilish eyes. The devil thought that when he looked at Jesus, he would be able to see something of himself in Jesus who has come down to the earth. After all, he is the devil. He was high up once with God too, remember? He was the chief of the angels. But what filled him ultimately was the desire for self-glory and the desire for self-power and the desire for self-honor and self-dominion. And as the devil looks at Jesus, he thinks there's got to be something of that in him too. It's got to be there. And I can exploit it and make him after my own image as my son. And do you see? That's what's so beautiful about studying the temptations of Christ. There wasn't anything of that in him. Not one ounce. Not one ounce. What motivated our Lord Jesus Christ to come down here amongst us was not self-glory, was not self-exaltation, but love for his Father and love for you. He knew. He knew that what you needed was not a political ruler to unite, to unite you all and to lead you all into your fullest human earthly potential. He knows that no matter how much potential you have reached, how much art you have produced, how much wealth you have gathered, on your own, you are nothing else than rebels who are under the threat of the eternal wrath of God. And such was His love for you. And such was His mercy for you. That He was willing to do whatever it took to keep that threat from falling upon your soul, even if it meant reproach and suffering and eventually the taking of that eternal wrath of God upon himself. He will do that. He was not the image of the devil. He was the image of his God, the express image of his Father. The Father's glory, and love for the brethren, is all that is driving him. There is therefore, beloved, at the end of three temptations, still a perfect righteousness that may be imputed to you and to me. There is, at the end of three temptations, still a spotless sacrifice to take the punishment for your sins and mine. There is still a gospel, beloved, and not glorious in the eyes of the world, but for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear of their own predicament before God, a glorious gospel of salvation in Christ, a gospel of the spiritual kingdom that in the next life will cover the entire face of the earth. For for his work, willing submission to the way of his Father, God will give his Son a true and full and glorious kingdom. Upon Jesus' ascension into heaven, God will command His Son to make the request of Psalm 2, verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. All throughout the history of time, He will gather His elect from all nations, tribes, and tongues, and one day He will return in glory, to remove all evil and all evil doers, and the whole earth and the new heavens and new earth will be his kingdom, and all will be to the glory of God, free of sin and its consequences. That's the inheritance of his Father. And that's your inheritance too. We must follow the Lord Jesus Christ here, beloved. We must preach, live, and breathe the spiritual heavenly kingdom of God, kingdom of the cross, 
We must live in God's service in every aspect of life, but must proclaim the good news of full atonement for sin. And though that cross and all of its truth that surrounds it, as it stands at the center of the whole counsel of God, will bring the church as Jesus promised, rejection and scorn from the world. It is the way of the kingdom. It is the way of salvation. For what does it profit? The Lord Jesus said to us, probably with this third temptation in the back of his mind, what does it profit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? In this way, the way of the cross, in the end we will partake of the glory of the heavenly kingdom of God. Luke 2, verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom of God. Matthew 5, verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In the new heavens and new earth, we will share in Christ's glory and the glory of God Himself as His kingdom is ushered in in all of its beauty and majesty, never to be diminished forever and ever. And now, now it is to get on with the work of leading the church to that glorious end that Jesus now sends the devil away. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. Go away. Lord Jesus knows that the devil has come to the end of his game. The third temptation was his grand climax, his grand offer, and there's nothing left anymore. Go away, get thee hence, which signals the end of this, signals victory, a vanquishing of the foe. And the devil leaves, and the angels come and minister to Jesus. They provide food, they provide water, they provide encouragement. And then, beloved, don't fail to see what happens next in Matthew chapter 4. The Lord Jesus goes away to a very inglorious little town named Nazareth and then to another inglorious little town named Capernaum. And he does very inglorious work of preaching the gospel of his cross that is now set before him. He goes to call those who have eyes to see and ears to hear to teach of sin and grace, to draw his own, to spiritually see the kingdom of God out of the kingdoms of this world and unto himself. He goes out to build his church the spiritual kingdom of his Father. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful for thy word and spirit that leads and guides us. And we're thankful for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, established by sovereign power in our hearts. Bless us under it, and may it continue. And gather thine own till the coming of thy Son again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Two hundred forty three. Two hundred forty three. We sang this last Sunday night, but after this, I feel like singing about Jesus again and his victory, and I assume you do too. Let's sing the first five of two hundred forty three. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.